Stop four visuals, you're right four. Stop four visual. Anyway, okay, well, picture slit, one eight zero for 12. Clap four, SE-6 launch the nose. Clap three, same. Clap three, spinal. Clap five, get up to the field, I'll find her. Say again. Stroke. Stroke three, come on. Stroke three, check right, break right. Stroke three, break right. Sam. Sam, break two. Clap four, confirm your position. Stroke three, break right, Sam, lock. Stroke three, break, clap four. Okay. Yeah, right three, right three. Sam, no. Wait, somebody got a hit. What force hit? Three Understand your hit. Hi, and welcome to another Falcon 4 BMS tutorial. In this tutorial, we're going to be going over the threats that you will encounter in BMS and Falcon 4. The biggest challenge for beginners is defending against these threats. And many can use the systems of the F-16... They can use the avionics, but few can defend against threats, and they tend to die horribly. This video is going to cover how to defeat the common threats that you will encounter in BMS. So what are the sort of threats that you're going to run into in BMS? First, you have your anti-aircraft artillery, commonly referred to as AAA, and that's defeated by jinking vertically. Second, you're going to have your radar-guided missiles, and they're defeated by maneuvers and by deploying little bundles of metal called chaff. Third, you have your heat or infrared guided missiles and they're defeated by flares and maneuvers. Lastly, you're going to have your direct ground fire and the deadliest is going to come from self-propelled AAA platforms such as the ZSU-23-24 Shilka and the SA-19 Tunguska and they're defeated by avoidance of the weapon envelope and jinking. Before we proceed, we do need to mention one more defense that the F-16 commonly has, and that is the jammer pod. The jammer is a pod that is usually attached to the center line of the wing that will decrease the max effective range of enemy radar emitters. So, it won't make a missile lose its lock on you, but what it will force an enemy aircraft to do is to get closer to you in order to employ that weapon. And the same goes for SAMs. You can get closer to SAMs when you have a jammer on, and their max effective engagement range on you will be reduced. So let's start with the AAA, which is perhaps the most common threat you will encounter in BMS. The concept behind AAA goes like this. Someone spots you, either by radar or by optical means, and then the rounds leave the gun, and then they have a predetermined time of flight, then they burst to form a broad planner pattern. Imagine a plate of fire in the sky, which changes position every 10 seconds or so. Optically guided AAA will bead onto your position more slowly. In other words, it will track onto you more slowly, while radar guided AAA will do so rapidly. You'll know if it's radar guided if a fire can radar is locking you up on your RWR, radar warning receiver. And it's represented by a flashing S and an A while in search mode, and a solid A when tracking and firing. So, how do you avoid it? Well, first, if you're above 30,000 feet, you typically won't be engaged. If you are engaged, in other words, if you see these explosions all around your jet, you need to change your vertical position frequently and quickly, in other words, jink, in order to avoid the immediate effects of the fire, and then burn out of the weapons envelope. If the AAA is especially heavy, you can decrease altitude to less than 2,000 feet above terrain level which represents the minimum engagement range of the guns. But do take caution in that doing so will expose you to a, a wide range of short-range air defenses, such as man pads and the aforementioned uh, shilkas. Okay, so we're now in game, and I'm going to show you guys how to defend AAA in real time. Now, I have a AAA site to my 12 o'clock defending an airbase. Normally, you wouldn't know that AAA was there, and if you could, you would try to avoid it. But in this scenario, I'm going to fly directly into the AAA so it fires on me. This way I can show you how to defend against it, okay? And I'm in a aircraft that has like a typical seed loadout. It has two harms, two CBUs, and some air-to-air -air ordnance, and a centerline jammer. And again, if you were to turn your jammer on, it would take the AAA radar longer to lock onto you than if your jammer was off, okay? And how do you know if the jammer's on is this little... 
uh, there's a little light here. It says ECM, and there's a little light under it. And when you press the Juliet key on your keyboard, that is J, it turns the jammer on. Okay. Okay, now I'm getting spiked by it. It's in an active mode, and it's either firing on me right now or it's about to fire. We'll see splashes in a moment all around my jet. And again, you would not be flying into a AAA battalion such as like this. This is very stupid behavior. Turn my jammer off so it fires at me. Okay, now I'm going to start jinking vertically. So that fire, I'm in the burn right now, and I'm jinking vertically. Okay? I'm just changing my altitude. Changing my altitude quickly. And if the AAA is really heavy, you might have to dive down below 2,000 feet. Okay? But this isn't that heavy. Just jinking in the vertical. Pulling up, pulling down. You can do a little horizontal jink as well, but not that much, not necessary. Okay? Chaff also, flare. deploy some chaff, and that will chaff might throw flare. the radar off. Chaff I can flare. see the explosions around me. Chaff flare. Okay. Chaff flare. We're almost out of the... Chaff flare. Almost out of the max range of the artillery. Chaff flare. Tell from the RWR. Keep jinking. Chaff flare. Chaff flare. Okay, almost out of it. Every Chaff time you flare. jink, you know, trade a little more altitude Chaff up or down. Don't, don't make it a repeatable pattern, otherwise you're gonna get hit. Chaff flare. Okay. Chaff flare. Almost out. Okay. Flare, low. And now we're out of the threat circle. Next we are going to cover radar guided missiles. The basic concept behind a radar guided threat is that a radar is illuminating your aircraft and directing a missile towards it. I don't want to get too far into depth on the different types of radar tracking, but for the most part, and for many of the threats you will encounter in BMS, deploying chaff changing aspect and obstructing line of sight between the radar and yourself by terrain or obstacle masking will render radar guided missiles ballistic. Missiles can be guided by semi-active or active guidance. Semi-active missiles must have the target continuously illuminated by the emitter in order to hit the target, while active missiles contain their own radar suites which allow them to tr track targets autonomously of the guidance of the emitter. Semi-active missiles are the overwhelming majority in BMS and include the AIM-7 Sparrow, the AA-10 Alamo, and the SA-2 through the SA-6. Active missiles include the AIM-120 AMRAM and the R-77 Adder. And some of the newest SAMs from the SA-10 family are also fully active. Some missiles may not be defeated by mere aspect change masking or chaff and need to be defeated by maneuvering so as to either one bleed off their energy and this is known as dragging dragging a missile or two kinetically defeat the missile by forcing it into an impossible intercept solution you should always assume that a missile is going to actively track on you and is going to hit you when you detect the launch and defend accordingly i can't stress this enough just because chaff will usually confuse a missile and cause it to break its lock, you should always treat the missile as if it's going to hit you. Also note that killing the emitter on semi-active missile launches will render the missile harmlessly ballistic. In the case of air-to-air -air missiles, this means killing the aircraft, and in the case of SAMs, it means destroying the targeting radar. So now we're back in game, 
and we're going to go over one of the most common scenarios that you're going to run across while flying BMS, and that's having an AA-10 Alamo missile fire to you. The AA-10 Alamo is a radar-guided, medium-range, semi-active missile that is commonly carried by the MiG-29, but is also carried by other enemy aircraft. And the Alamo's effective range out actually outranges the aim ram significantly, but in reality, uh, most engagements against the MiG-29 using this missile will be within visual range, and that is because the jammer is very effective against the MiG-29's targeting radar. So before we go over the technique for defending against such a threat, we're going to go over positioning. Okay, So ideally, when you're engaging and uh, defending against a MiG-29 or another threat in the same class, you want to keep the threat on the beam, okay? And beam the beam position is to your 10 o'clock, where he is right now, or your 2 o'clock. And by keeping the contact at your 10 o'clock or 2 o'clock, also known as beaming, that allows you to create the most lateral separation and tactical options between yourself and the target. So, for instance, if he was at my 12 o'clock, he was flying directly towards me, then he'd be closing at me at a much higher rate than he would if he were attacking from my 10 o'clock. And the missile, if he were to fire a missile from my 12 o'clock, it'd be much more deadly than if he fired it from my uh, 10 o'clock. So another concept is, is that when we actually go defensive and we defend against the missile launch, I want this 29, I want the enemy MiG to be behind my 3-9 line. And you can imagine the 3-9 line if you consider the RWR to be a clock, okay? This would be the 3 o'clock position. This would be the 9 o'clock position. We want this 29 in the rear quadrant of the RWR. And when we go a little bit further in the tutorial and we're actually defending against active missiles, we want the M in the rear quadrant of the RWR, okay? If if, it, if a contact is in front of the 3-9 line, then it's posing a significant threat. Now, that being said, let's go over the technique for what we're going to do. I'm going to approach this MiG on the beam. I'm going to have my jammer off. This way he actually fires at me and doesn't wait. You know, he doesn't wait to get within about 5 miles. And once he fires at me, I'm going to do a split S. I'm going to burn and deploy chaff. Okay? And as I gain speed and I dive, I'm going to start weaving a bit, which is going to make the missile maneuver against me, and eventually I'm going to pull up. And the reason why we're doing that is I want to get low, I want to get low. this way the missile burns up more of its energy trying to track me. And you finally pull up at the end, at the end of the defense, because if the missile's still tracking you, which is unlikely with the Alamo, but it's very likely with, with an adder, um, you want to pull up to make it burn off the last of its energy. So again, I'm going to dive, pop chaff, I'm going to beam away from the target, or where I think the missile's coming from, and then I'm going to pull up at the very end when I believe the missile is almost out of fuel, and that will cause it to fully burn out of fuel.
Chat flare low. Chat flare. Chat flare. Pull up. Pull up. Pull up. Chat flare. Pull up. Chat flare. Pull up. Chat flare. Pull up. Chat Pull up. Pull up. Chat flare. Pull up. Chat flare. Pull up. Pull up. Chat Pull up. Pull up. Pull up. Chat Chat flare. Pull up. Pull up. Pull up. Chat flare. Chat flare. Chat flare. Chat flare. Before we move on to the next part, I just want to say that the same defense that we use against the Alamo can be used against other medium-range semi-active missiles. So there's a whole family of semi-active missiles that can be carried by the enemy Air Force. If you get a missile launch tone on your RWR, then 9 times out of 10, it's a semi-active radar-guided missile. Just treat it the same way you would an Alamo. Now that being said, the next thing we're going to go over is the R-77 Adder, also known as the AA-12. This is arguably the deadliest threat you'll ever come up against, and it's carried by the Su-27, the MiG-29S, and the Su-30. The R-77 is an active, medium-range radar missile that is extremely fast, extremely maneuverable, and extremely resistant to chaff and ECM. Now we're going to use essentially the same strategy that we use against the Alamo except this time we're not going to know when his missile is actually fired. We won't know that because the way that the Adder works is it's guided passively by the MiG until it goes into a pit bull or active state just like the AMRAM and then and only then will you be alerted that it's locked on to you. So because of that, whenever we get hard locked and we know that he's within range to fire at us, we're going to assume that he's already fired at us. Okay? And normally what you would do is, is if you were trying to kill this MiG, you would fire a Fox 3 long at him when you're just within max range using your aim ram, then you'd notch away from him and then go defensive. Now... I'm going to do that in this example, and I might kill him, and if I kill him, then the next time I'll do it, I'll just redo it and let him, I'll make sure that he fires on me by just flying into him a little longer. But the idea here is that, you know, I'm going to put him on the beam, once I'm in max range, I'm going to fire at him, notch away, then do a split S after a few seconds, burn, drop altitude, gain as much speed as possible, and during this entire time, I'm going to be burning, because I, you need as much speed as possible to defeat the adder. And we'll know once it's become active when we get an M on our RWR. And then what we're going to do is we're going to weave so it's on the beam so it burns up as much energy as possible at the lowest altitude possible. And then hopefully uh, it will burn up its energy. We can pull up, finish it off, and get back into the fight. That being said, let's go ahead and unpause the game. Chat flare, 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 chat flare
Pull up, flare, pull up, chaff, pull up, pull up, flare, chaff, pull up, chaff, flare, pull up, chaff, pull up, chaff, flare, chaff, pull up, chaff, flare, chaff, pull up, chaff, Our next area of coverage is a surface-to-air radar-guided missile. The most common SAMs you will encounter in BMS are the SA-2, the 3, the 4, the 5, and the 6. All are semi-active systems that can be defeated just like the Alamo, except there's some differences when you're defending against SAMs. Defending SAMs varies from air-to-air -air medium-range missiles mainly due to the fact that it's much easier to get ambushed by a SAM that suddenly turns on without warning. This is known as a pop-up threat. When this happens, you often don't have enough time to drag the missile and will have to kinetically defeat it by performing a high G break into the missile's path at a well-calculated time. This is virtually impossible with air-to-air -air missiles due to the maneuverability of the air-to-air -air missiles. You would need to pull more G's than your airframe and body would allow in order to dodge an R a uh, R-77 Adder, for instance. Each SAM has different characteristics, and I would highly recommend checking out the Falcon 4 Threat Guide PDF in the video description. Regardless, if the SAM fires at max range, it can typically be defeated by simply turning and popping chaff. The SA-2 through the SA-6 are also very susceptible to aspect changes, ECM, and chaff. Many times a track will be lost just from doing a 4G turn away from the emitter and popping chaff. It doesn't require an in-depth demonstration, but I will show you how to kinetically defeat a SAM for instances in which you cannot drag or simply just turn away from a SAM threat. And keep in mind that the deadliest SAMs, I would say an SA-6 and above, are, are deadly enough that you can't simply turn away from them. You have to deal with them in some other manner, which involves kinetically defeating those missiles. So how do you kinetically defeat a SAM? First, you're going to put it on your beam. This will allow you to visually acquire the missile as it launches and to create enough space to react to it. Visual acquisition of the missile is absolutely essential. Failure to spot the missile will result in death, especially at close ranges. Look around for large plumes of smoke on the ground and smoke trails rising up from it. And if in doubt, try using your padlock key, which is 4 on the keyboard. Step 1 when engaged by a SAM is always to find it with the Mark 1 eyeball. And this is less important when it's engaging you at long range, as we saw before with the SA-2 defense. Wait for it to fly pursuit on you or intercept it yourself, depending on the tactical situation, and then a few seconds before it is about to hit you, perform a high G break away from the missile path, 
so that it cannot correct onto you. Employ a large amount of chaff as you break away. The missile should pass over you and then go ballistic. So we now have three tools in our tool set. Dragging a missile to render it powerless, performing a sustained turn to defeat long range launches, and kinetically breaking into a missile's path to force it off course. But that's not all. There's two more common tools for radar SAM defense. Masking and exiting the weapon envelope. The first involves using terrain and obstacles to block line of sight between your aircraft and the radar emitter, thus disrupting semi-active radar systems, while the latter involves diving to very low altitudes so that the aircraft descends below the minimum altitude for the SAM system, rendering the missile ballistic and additional launches impossible. Every SAM has different minimum engagement altitudes, but for most systems, descending below 500 feet above terrain level will render tracking impossible. Certain uh, short-range air defense systems, such as the SA-15 TOR and SA-8 Gecko, and the most advanced long-range SAMs, such as those in the SA-10 family, can engage virtually down to 100 feet above terrain level. Luckily, you will rarely, if ever, encounter these in the stock campaigns that come with BMS. For specific engagement altitudes, check the threat guide PDF in the video description. And I would again caution that descending to such a low altitude exposes you to a number of serious threats, such as the man-portable, shoulder-fired, heat-seeking missile, and direct ground fire. Okay, so now we're back in game, and now we're going to go over how to go below a SAM's minimum engagement altitude, and also how to use terrain and obstacles to mask... Uh, yourself from a radar emitter in order to defeat a SAM. And these tactics are typically used uh, when you're already at low altitude and you're fired upon by a SAM. You don't have the option to, you know, pull up and try to kinetically defeat a SAM. It's also used if you are, if you need to still fly into the area where the SAM is defending and you don't have any seed escorts or seed assets, you would go really low, nap of the earth flying use terrain masking and low altitude approaches in order to attack the target area. Um, it's used in a, in a variety of situations and you'll know them when you see them. So let's get started. In this scenario, there's an SA-3 up ahead defending a bridge. 
and I have the same loadout as the other parts of the video. I have two harms and some CBUs, typical seed loadout and a jammer. Uh, we're going to go ahead and pretend that um, I don't have a jammer and I don't have the harm, so that would make the most sense for this video. I'm going to proceed along the flight plan as if I was going to strike the bridge from medium altitude and then respond to the SA-3 pop-up threat. So now I'm ingressing towards the target, just past the IP. I have SA-3 nails. I'm going to put my throttle to idle and then nose down about 25 degrees. The reason why I'm putting it to idle is because uh, if you go above 600 knots in Cat 3 conditions, you can seriously damage your aircraft. I'm also beaming, putting the SA-3 on the beam right now. I'm diving towards these buildings because I figure if it fires on me, right now I can at least mask behind those buildings and now I'm sort of surveying the train so I can see to the left of the target I can see to the left of the target there's some hills that might be provide a good way to pop up on the target now if this was an actual mission and I was trying to hit this target I would just terrain mask behind these hills and then pop up and hit the target but since this is educational I'm supposed to be showing you how to how SAMs go ballistic at low altitude I'm going to intentionally jink into the target and try to get it to fire on me and then use the principles that we've gone over to avoid uh, being killed. Right now I'm just above the minimum engagement range for the SA-3 and I know that. I want it to fire at me. Altitude. Altitude. That's a spike. And here's a launch. Now what I do is I dive, see how I dive down below this little ridge? I know that I'm denying line of sight to the radar to me. And uh, that's going to make the missile break its lock. And you can tell the RWR went silent, and now the SA-3 went ballistic up into the air. Some good terrain to mask. See here on the left, in this little ravine... The radar does not have a line of sight on me, and if it does momentarily get line of sight, I can dive down Altitude. behind one of these hills. Altitude. Altitude. And again, um, you know, if I was actually intending to hit this target, I wouldn't be doing this. The only reason I'm doing this is to have it fire on me again. I would have just approached from the left side of the target in that mass terrain, popped up, and then dropped CBUs on the target. Altitude. Altitude. Right now I'm masked, now I'm unmasked. See how I popped up a little bit? I'm trying to get it to shoot at me. Altitude. Altitude. SA-3 is a pretty fast missile, so... If you mess up doing this, you can die rather quickly. So I just went completely around the radar emitter. Altitude. And it didn't fire on me, mainly because I was masked for most of the time. Altitude. When we go over this little ridge here, I'm, I'm going to be uh, Altitude. revealed, I believe. Altitude. 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 Now I'm lining up for a, uh, a pop-up attack. This is a really Altitude. ad hoc pop-up attack. Um, you know, I'm not really calculating this that well, so it looks pretty sloppy, but um, it just shows you what you can do with masking. About 40 degrees off the nose now. I'm going to pull and then drop CBUs on the bridge. CBUs away. Pull up. Pull up. Pull up. CBUs away. And now it's going to give him a chance to take a shot at me because I unmasked myself. I don't think I hit the radar. Now, see how I'm up? I went above the minimum engagement range. Now he's going to fire on me, but luckily there's terrain here I can mask behind. Now watch this, because this is an excellent demonstration of terrain masking in action. I go behind this hill, and now watch the missile just ballistically fly overhead, just completely trackless. And there we have it. The next weapon we're going to overview is the heat-seeking infrared missile, also known as a heat seeker or heater. The heater's mechanism of tracking is by use of a thermal contrast. 
while a radar is often used to slave a heater's seeker to a target. The actual missile guidance is entirely by means of IR seeking. Once a heater comes off the rail, it requires no support and is fully autonomous. Take note that a stray fired IR missile can lock onto any nearby heat signature, including friendlies. It's important to note that you'll have no warning that a heater has been fired at you other than visual, because as we have discussed, it does not use radar. Heaters are typically short-range missiles used in visual range, although the newest heaters do have the potential for beyond visual range engagement. The T models of the AA-10 Alamo also have terminal IR guidance. An important concept in IR missiles is the aspect capabilities of the seeker. Early generation missile seekers, such as those found on the AA-2 Atoll and the AIM-9 Papa, could only receive good locks from rear quarter shots on enemy aircraft. That is to say, the IR missile would only lock when in view of the aircraft's engine or exhaust. IR missiles designed and entering service during the 1980s introduced full aspect capability, the most notorious of which was the AA-11 Archer, first carried by the MiG-29. When defending a heater, aspect capability is critical. Old systems such as the SA-7 Strela, fired at nose aspect, have a minuscule chance of hitting, while the Archer is deadly from any aspect and any approach. You should treat any heater fired at you as a full aspect missile, but should be aware that older aircraft such as the MiG-21 and MiG-19 almost always carry rear aspect heaters while the newer MiG-23, MiG-29, and Sukhois carry full aspect missiles. Heaters also manifest in the form of shoulder-fired man-portable systems, commonly abbreviated as man-pads. The vast majority of the DPRK Army and BMS carry the SA-7 Strela. The Strela is extremely ineffective. It's a short-range man-pad which is highly sensitive to flares and maneuvers. That being said, a small percentage of elite units in the DPRK carry the SA-16 Gimlet, a full aspect and very dangerous manpad system. Ultimately, when you go below 12,000 feet or so, the max effective engagement range for most manpads, you should be looking for launches, you should expect a manpad launch, and deploy flares as you pop up or dive down for terminal attacks. Flares are what confuse heat-seeking missiles and are typically much more effective than chaff is to radar-guided missiles. Even the newest heat-seeking missiles can be reasonably defeated by a large output of flares and a high G-break at any aspect or range. Of course, heat-seekers are extremely deadly if you are out of flares, and it's virtually impossible to defend an archer or other current generation heater without flares. Defending heaters without countermeasures is much deadlier than defending radar-guided missiles without countermeasures. Okay, now we're back in game, and we're going to go over how to defeat heat-seeking missiles. Now, unlike the radar segment, the radar missile segments, which are quite lengthy and sort of complicated different maneuvers, to defeat a heat-seeker, it's pretty simple, because you only have about five seconds to do something before it hits you due to the, the ranges involved. And all it, all it includes is simply... You know, approximating where the aircraft is going to fire from, and then breaking away from the missile path and popping flares. That's pretty much it. And uh, there's there's not much more to it than that. So I got a Su-27 to merge. He's got two archers. We're going to fly towards him. I'm going to let him fire at me, and then I'm going to defend accordingly. And keep in mind that he's using full aspect missiles, so it could be a little different if. Uh, if this was like a MiG-21 or something. So make sure you have a flare program selected. Just keep in mind, flares flares are the only thing that are effective against heaters. Uh, you know, the the chaff does nothing. So make sure you have the flare selected. Make sure you have a flare program set on your data cartridge. For me, it's program two. And uh, I'm going to unpause and then show you what to do. Well, make sure you pump out quite a few flares as well. Especially with the archer, because the archer is quite resistant to um, the archer is quite resistant to flares. So make sure you pump out at least eight flares. So we're in the merge now. And the one I should add that the one really dangerous thing about the archer is that it has off-bore sight capability of about 60 degrees, 
meaning he doesn't have to point at me in order to fire the missile. He can be as far away as 60 degrees off my nose, and he can still fire at me, and that missile will track just as well. The Archer is an extremely deadly missile, uh, on par with the AIM-9X and the Python 5. Looks like he's... Looks like he's beaming. Now, if he turned into me right now, he could get a... He could get an Archer shot off. Uh, due to the Austin Foresight capability, which he's probably going to do. He's probably going to come up, probably going to climb, and then turn into me and fire an archer at me. And if he does that, I'm going to break right, and uh, I'm going to break right and pop flares. Here he comes. Cat flare. Cat flare. One archer down. Altitude. Altitude. When you're in it, when you're in a fight with uh, missiles, short-range missiles, make sure. Oh, there's a second flare. one breaking left. Cat flare. Cat flare. Low. That's it for him. He's out of missiles. So it's that simple, guys. The point is, is just get you know get those flares out. That's the most important thing is that you get the flares out. Okay. Doesn't, you know, the maneuver and the break and all that, it's not that important compared to just the fact that you have to get those flares out, otherwise you're just not going to kill the target. So here's another common scenario that you might find yourself in, and that is doing ground attack operations where you have to break a hard deck of about 15,000 feet. And in these sort of missions, like Oka strikes and, stri and missions where you have to drop bombs on bridges or drop bombs on tanks or whatever. Um, when you go below 15,000, you expose yourself to a wide range of threats, including man pads. And when you go below 15,000, you should expect to be fired upon by man pads. You should preemptively pop flares, and you should very aggressively scan with your head, use the Mark 1 eyeball to look for launches. Okay? So, this is an Oka strike on the airbase that uh, was in the earlier part of the video, and I have six BLU 107s, some air to air ordnance, and a centerline jammer. I have a wingman, although he's probably going to be worthless. And the air base is defended by two infantry battalions and a self propelled artillery battalion. All of them have a variety of man pads. The infantry battalions have SA 7 Strellas, and the self propelled gun battalions, I believe, have SA 14s, which are a full aspect IR missile. So what we're going to do is we're about six and a half miles from the IP. We're going to fly this as if we were doing the mission. And you're going to see how I use flares, you know, preemptively and actively to defeat man pads that are going to pop up. It's always amazing to see how many man pads actually pop up. And um, often, more often than not, you won't even see them. But when you watch replays and stuff like that, you'll see them flying up at you. And uh, that's never a good sign. That means you're moments away from death. Always preemptively pop flares when you're on the target. And at, especially as you're egressing. That's when you usually get hit. Is when you're pulling up and egressing. That's when you'll usually get hit right in the tailpipe. So that being said, make sure you have a flare program selected. And um, you're pretty much good to go. So we're approaching the airbase. We're about six miles to the IP. At the IP, we're going to begin a combat dive. down you can visually see the airbase and I can see looks pretty clear at this time but we're gonna take a closer look when we get down to the IP. We're at the IP now. Let's begin a combat dive. I'm inspecting the area now I spot some vehicles on the left side of the airbase. Look like some BMPs. Looks like a whole battalion there lined up on the left side of the airbase. That's gonna be my primary concern as I dive. Two in position. We going to expect SAM launchers from the left side. The idea here is we're going to run in at fast speed, low altitude, drop our bombs. And as you go below about 12,000, start really scanning for launches. This is the death zone. Altitude. Altitude. As you go below 10,000, that's really deadly. Okay, here it goes. I'm almost on final now. Okay. And as soon as we begin to run onto the target, we're going to stop. We're going to start popping flares. Here 
ghost. Cat flare. Cat flare. Falcon. Cat flare. Pull up. 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 Pull once we're out of the threat envelope, we're going to gain altitude. Lastly, we're going to cover how to defend ground fire. It's pretty simple. You can't. At least not effectively. Ground fire is extremely deadly and the best defense is simply avoiding it. This involves inspecting the target area before the mission, and if it's a sort of interdiction and you're not sure where your attacks will be taking place, then you need to not descend below a predetermined minimum operating altitude. This is often referred to as a hard deck. The hard deck for most missions is probably 15,000. Although once you become very proficient with the Viper, you can descend to as low as 9 or 10,000. Anything lower than that is just stupid. It's, a, it's an invitation to eat a shilka or man pad. If you do find yourself in a situation in which you are taking ground fire, your only hope is to burn as fast as possible out of the envelope, terrain mask, and make small and rapid vertical then horizontal jinx in alternating turns. Do not, I repeat, do not pull directly up when taking accurate ground fire. You will die. So here's another scenario you're likely to run into in the campaign, and that's doing an interdiction on moving ground units. And this is when a lot of people get hit by ground fire, because they don't really know how to, you know, line up an attack run so that they come up above the hard deck. So I can't really show you how to avoid ground fire because all it involves is jinking and burning out of the envelope, and that's pretty self-explanatory. But what I can show you how to do, which might be useful, is I'm going to show you how to how to successfully stay out of that envelope completely and do a dive bomb attack by approaching at medium altitude, nosing down sharply onto a target, and then. Uh, releasing ordnance, pulling up before you break the hard deck, and it's pretty simple. The way I would do it is, I know you know th in this mission there's a moving motor rifle battalion up ahead. I know that there's enemy in the general vicinity of about 60 miles. I'm just gonna put my radar into GMT mode, ground moving target. I'm gonna find them on the radar, lock them up, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna offset from the target by about 20 degrees and then at about uh, 3 miles or 4 miles I'm going to nose down sharply drop the bombs while popping flares and then come up above the hard deck and the hard deck for this is about 12,000 because uh, there's SA-9 geckos in the um, inside the battalion there's also man pads so it's quite a substantial threat from the battalion, and if I mess this up, I pretty much die. I have four CBU 87s and a centerline tank. I've located the column moving on GMT. I'm going to lock up the end of the column. It's about uh, five degrees left on my nose. I'm trying to gain some altitude here. You want to be at at least 19 or 20,000 to do a proper dive bomb attack. We're going to offset to the right or left of the target. This way we can see it. We can see it better. Because we're, if we're, we're approaching at 12 o'clock, we're the front of the nose is going to mask the target. We're not going to be able to see it. It's about 14 miles to my 11 o'clock approximately. I'm going to use CCRP mode in order to locate them. There, there they are. See them moving parallel to the road. I'm going to keep approaching them. We 
going to use CCRP to orient ourselves to the column. Then we're, when we're at a good enough distance, uh, about, let's say about three more miles, we're going to nose down about 40 degrees and drop our bombs. Set a little bit more. Got a triple A spike. I'm going to clock almost into a nice position here. Say about five miles or so. Now we're going to roll on to the target. Cat flare. CBU's away. CBU's away. about five miles or so. Now we're going to roll on to the target. Cat flare. CBU's away. Cat flare. To tie all this together, I want to discuss some basic principles of defense. I have shown you the procedures for defending various threats, but haven't spoken about how all of this relates to smart flying. The unspoken truth is that you should try to avoid all of these threats, which have been overviewed in this video, before they fire on you. Properly being able to read and interpret the RWR is essential, as well as understanding the concept of beaming. You should always try to put hostile emitters on the beam, and to keep them in the outer ring of the RWR. Another important concept is using your eyes. Eyes are the most underrated feature in flight simulators, mainly because new people become obsessed with the avionics. When in doubt, just look outside of the cockpit. A third principle is space. You need space between you and a threat. The less space, the deadlier it is. If you're close enough to a MiG-29 to have it fire its archer at you, I hope you were being ambushed and didn't intentionally put yourself in that situation. There is no dishonor and simply doing a split S and burning away from a target. Create space from threats if you are unsure of what's going on. Don't keep flying into the unknown. You're going to end up exploding seemingly out of nowhere. If you see a MiG on your RWR, then it suddenly disappears. Chances are it's not gone, but very low and about to ambush you. Think about stuff like that. Don't ignore obvious signs of danger. Fourth, whenever you do something, think. How can I die doing what I'm about to do? And how will I escape if I get engaged by what could kill me? Thinking like that will hopefully stop you from thinking it's okay to fly 3,000 feet off the ground while dropping bombs, when virtually all the weapons in the enemy arsenal, besides the AK-47, will be able to engage you from that altitude. Lastly, rely on your wingmen and support your leads. If there's a SAM launch and it's not on you, that doesn't give you license to just keep flying and going on your merry way. You better be looking outside and helping people defend against it. Helping people is what it's all about. If you try to defend against a SAM blind, it's a recipe for disaster. I hope this video was helpful. Stay frosty.